Okay. Um, I guess it'd be nice to share about how we all met since um, I think it's quite interesting. So uh, I'm Allison and I just graduated uh, with my PhD just last year. So now I'm doing my postdoc and actually continuing off of my PhD project right now. And um, in my first year of my PhD, my uh, PI recommended me to lead the Graduate Student Society to help um, gather the students for events and for um, any new ideas that can make the graduate experience um, more collective and enriched. So then uh, we, we started that and from that I think I met um, Maran who was a great addition to um, uh, this GSS community. And unfortunately then COVID hit. So like the amount of ideas we had, we, we couldn't bring them to fruition. Um, but on the other side, it uh, I think we, since we had a lot of ideas, then um, it was really nice just to bounce ideas off of each other. Yeah, I, I find that quite cute because like, like really uh, I joined and then we did like one event uh, <laughs> and after that like the entire community just like the entire community just dissolved. I don't think we did anything after that again and in the end we just ended up like hanging out like all the plans we, we were supposed to do as a committee we just ended up doing by ourselves. Yeah, that, that's pretty funny. But actually that makes I think Alice and one of the first people I I probably knew in CSI. It's kind of crazy. I never never thought about that. <laughs> yeah, I actually didn't even know that you guys know each other from the society. Okay, cool. Uh, and I do want to come back to that. I think that's that is interesting. But uh, maybe let's start with okay. Let me let me ask you a more direct question. Um, how did you decide to do a PhD? Let's start with that, and then we can talk about what you did in your PhD. Yeah, you can even go further back. Um, from like your master's, bachelor's education as well back in the US. Oh. Why science? Whoa. Well, mm -hmm. that, that's really far <laughs> back. So when I was in university, I actually wanted to do medical school. And in the US, you have to do a full undergraduate degree and then take a test, like an MCAT test, and then apply for medical school. Um, and during that like pre-med process, um, my roommate Jessica recommended me to do some research as well. And so I applied to do research in an ophthalmology lab. And actually, I found it so fun. Um, ophthalmology. What were you doing there? Uh, Something with the ears? <laughs> uh, studying like dry eye disease. Oh, um, a little bit about how like, <laughs> fish oil, for example, uh, helps with dry eyes. Ooh, does it? Uh yes, like DHA. Um, you mean eating fish oil, right? Not putting it in the eyes. Uh yes, consumption. Okay. okay. Um and when I was taking the MCAT test, it was so brutal, and I was like, "Wait, why do I want to be a doctor so bad?" And actually, will do I think I'm fit to be a doctor? And then on the other hand. I really enjoyed science and research. So, um, well, I did an internship in Singapore during my, the year before my se senior year. And um, then I got to do my first um, type of cancer biology research at ASTAR. And I, I think that's what drew me to continue research in Singapore. And from then on, when I, I did my RA first, research assistant position for a year, and uh, my professor uh, recommended me to continue on with a PhD. And yeah, that's where I am now. Yeah, quite nice. I, I do feel like a decent number of biology PhDs at some point have considered like a medical career. Um, that's true. Not all of them, obviously, but I think a good chunk, right? And it yeah. usually goes something like this. They start out in medicine and then they realize, oh, God, this is horrible. Okay, what else can I do? <laughs> how about think, uh, you guys? Um, how was your entry into cancer biology research? Yeah, go first, go on. Um, sure. Um, somehow after, I think we have discussed this earlier as well. I uh, During 12th standard, 
this is where after which you start your undergrad i took both maths and biology so normally people who want to go into medicine they take biology and people who want to go into engineering they take math but somehow i took both and i don't know what i really wanted to do but i gave both exams <laughs> for engineering and and medicine um got like some some uh, uh acceptances into some colleges but at that time i wanted to do um civil services so i wanted to get into uh, civil services in india and in during that time i applied to um, a research institute and i thought i'll just do a bachelor's and then uh, go back to doing um, civil services so give exams and things like that because it requires an undergrad degree but when i joined iser which is indian institute of science education and research in pune back in india uh they ex- exposed me to a lot of research and there i got to do so many fun semester projects and then eventually masters project in cancer biology that's when i sort of realized there's so much to do in science there's so much to do in research uh and i just got uh, inclined towards doing more research and then i applied to a phd so i was not i never thought like this is what i'm going to do it i stumbled upon it and i just enjoyed it and uh, continued yeah but i i don't think i never, ever wanted to be a doctor my mom wanted me to be a doctor she still still asks me <laughs> You, you really didn't want to be a doctor <laughs> like no i don't think so yeah you know like it is all the time uh, from my father like he absolutely yeah. wanted me to be a doctor uh, yeah. and then i think i was never truly opposed to the idea but i was also never truly on board i was like yeah. i like biology so this is yeah. like the thing uh, that that was on the radar and then i think when i i think around the time when we had to give our medical exams as well i saw what it takes Um, to actually pass the exam right it was like yeah. ridiculous amount it's, of effort it's insane uh, people yeah, take drop years all the time it's like one year two years drop you to prepare mm-hmm. again and then you give the exams yeah and i was not up for that kind of uh, i guess you know mm. whatever you want to call it and, and even after that it's not just the entrance exactly, the entrance of course is so painful and after that mm-hmm. this, i don't know 7 8 years of absolute pain but i, I mean yeah, it has its own rewards of course yeah I, but i think you really need to have the right mindset for it right like to find that rewarding yeah so i, I think that was really not it for me so then but i, I knew that i still like biology so then in some ways it felt like research was like the only other uh, mm. good option right because yeah. at least in india there wasn't a lot of jobs where you can still do like proper biology stuff uh, so yeah i think it's really like out of lack of choices if you, if you want to put it that way yeah yeah i understand so when you entered srm you sort of knew about research and you sort of knew this is what you're getting into um actually to be honest not entirely i think it was more towards the final years where we got exposed to some research and then you know when the question of what next came around i think that's when it really hit of like oh should we get a job or like you know I still like this biology thing. What should I do? Then, then, then it became like okay. Then I guess masters. And even mm-hmm. during masters, I didn't know if I was going to do a PhD. But once I came, same thing happened. Like, oh, do I want to get a job <laughs> or do I want to keep doing this biology stuff? It's like, oh, okay, yeah. doing this. Like, yeah, PhD. yeah. Sometimes yeah, I do yeah. think though, like, is it just that you are, you know, going with the flow? Um, just because like this is just the next direction that you can take, and you just take it up, uh, mm-hmm. instead of making a informed choice. I don't know I'm just uh, thinking out I don't out think now. I ever thought like you know considered it's like oh okay you know these are all my options what am I going to choose yeah. I think it was very yeah. much with the flow kind of a scenario right which is also nice but all, like it has its pros and cons like even right now right after doing a phd where you are at this stage where you have the choice that you can mm. you know make actively um here also everybody just after the phd does a post doc that's just the normal yeah. way to go so you're just like okay let yeah. me just do a post doc and see how things turn out I guess like how did you stumble upon the lab which you did the PhD in like exactly perhaps um were you interested in the question or the PI or the lab environment or the institute or something like that Yeah I can answer this first I think for for my masters program uh that was pretty much uh like a random choice I got accepted into the department and i wrote to a few professors and the department was just like it was just called uh, department of biological sciences and they did very very stuff from ecology um to um, you know all bio development bio this is a very broad range i wrote to a few people who i thought were interesting and i pretty much joined the first lab that got back to me without giving it that much thought 
uh, and it just so happened to be a, a cancer lab. It was a liver cancer lab. Um, and I think that, again, sort of, again, in this very go with the flow sort of way, defined what I would end up doing in my PhD as well. Uh, because once I finished my master's and then I applied for PhD, now I had this cancer background. So I guess it made sense to apply to cancer programs. Uh, but I did take a different strategy though. For, um, for my PhD, I tried to be more selective, 100%, but I still didn't go by the topic. I think it was more of the, the lab, like the people in the lab, and I, I guess more importantly, uh, the mentor. Like now I'm, I'm fairly convinced this is the right thing you should do, uh, just basically do a wipe check, and if you don't wipe with the PI, don't join the lab. Mm -hmm. I think that should be top priority. Might be a controversial opinion, but I would say that even that is like 90% of what really matters. Well, yeah, the question was, how did I apply? Um, I think after my master's, I was just looking for interesting cancer research groups. And I would just apply to a lot of supervisors, a lot of PIs across UK and Singapore, I think Switzerland, just two countries. And then just made a choice depending on the acceptances I was getting. Did not really think too much about the topic or the mentor at that point. I was just looking at, okay, this university, I'm getting this, let's go. I will learn something, which came to, of course, like you, you get exposure to a lot of things um, and then things just turn out. How about you? Mm, for me, since my background was immunology, but I wanted to venture into cancer research, I think I specifically reached out to professors who were doing a um, combination of both um, across different NUS, um, like within NUS and also Duke NUS or East R. Yeah, and just reached out to a lot of them. And then I think the vibe check is really important too, because after like emailing them and then meeting up with them, um, then it's kind of like, do I do I like you as my mentor? And <laughs> that, at that point, it was like a good fit. So then, yeah, just continued. Mm. Yeah, you were also in Singapore, right? So you sort of knew, you sort of had some connections, I guess, at that point to get um, the information on how this person might both, be. Both my research assistant position and, both, and for my PhD. So when I was applying for the RA position, I was still in the US and just... Mm mass like emailing I guess to yeah. <laughs> professors in Singapore who I was interested in their research yeah for that it was quite blind um but luckily um my professor emailed me back and he was the kindest person ever so that was lucky oh, yeah that's nice but then when that's I was in Singapore sweet. yeah then when I was in Singapore I got to meet them face to face before like proceeding with my PhD that's great yeah. Do you want to elaborate a bit more on what you did during your PhD? Um, so when I started, it was um, combination screens for uh, chemotherapy and um, a DNA damage response inhibitor. And we just find the best combination for uh, lymphoma. And in a way, we also study the immune activation response after this, um, or also combinations of chemotherapy and um, monoclonal antibodies like rituximab, and also seeing the downstream interaction. So a lot of um, mechanistic work on how drugs work the way they do for lymphoma mm -hmm. and how to improve upon the current um, regimen. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, what was the cool. most yeah sorry go on you not go on i was just gonna ask uh, what aspect of your phd did you enjoy the most probably a lot i'm okay let's let's think um i think i always have a lot of crazy ideas and part of part of that during my phd journey i i really liked how my um uh, my prof allowed me to investigate all these crazy ideas but at the same time, um, they were probably stupid ideas as well because they didn't amount to anything in the end. And <laughs> I feel like that wasted a lot of time, which now compounds stress because I need to finish and um, write the paper and produce the results. And all that wasted time makes me feel like I'm behind. Um, but it was, I think, always being curious is enjoyable and even now 
I, I still have so many questions that I want to answer. Um, but ultimately, when I'm thinking about the next step of like, what type of research I want to do next, um, it kind of like leads off on what questions I still have, like the burning questions I have currently that I would like to delve into in the future. And for that, I think um, I'm kind of, it depends on how much I, I read about a certain topic, I think, then I'm like still equally confused. I feel like I have to do research on it. Yeah, so there's currently two topics, either studying complement in the microenvironment or um, mechanisms of apoptosis, yeah. Yeah, I have a bunch of questions to ask from that. So <laughs> that is a very interesting ask. response. Um, just, I, no, just just a few things that I that like I want to talk about uh, as well. But let me start with this. So you mentioned um, your PI, right? So he's a, a clinician scientist, mm -hmm. uh, which is certainly an interesting breed um, of people. Uh, do you have any, I guess? Uh, thoughts on how that is. I guess, I guess you do have, like, Takomi is also a clinic, who was a clinician at some point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, have you had experience working with somebody fully academic? I just want to know um, how you think that's different, or if there is any difference, um, and how that plays out when it comes to, like, mentorship, uh, the kind of ideas that they're interested in. I, I, I assume he wants things that are a bit more translational, or, yeah, just how that works out. I agree. I think each yeah each lab the the prof drives the research differently for example like um some are a lot more molecular and understanding um like the roots of of how things happen um and i think although now i'm still doing that it does feel a bit more translational um like the importance of the paper or the study lies in um how does this impact um patients rather than the question of like how does this work whether or not it impacts patients yeah which which i think is a interesting um dichotomy not dichotomy it's not the right word it's just an interesting difference for me um, because like personally, like when I read a paper, right, the papers that I tend to get excited by are usually more basic science. Um, I guess this is just like attitude difference and like what kind of work you do that shapes your thinking. So like just today we had um, a journal club, which is a, okay, to be fair, it was not very translational, but it was very descriptive, right? They, it was like an multi-omics kind of situation where they describe, oh, these two clusters, so maybe these treatments work on these patients, this kind of stuff. Um, and like, I, I always find it um, cute, like just, I guess, interesting that how some people find that kind of work very interesting, uh, but I am like very, you know, on a different path. Like I, I like all, sounds really silly to say, so I almost don't care what happens to the patients. Just tell me what's happening in the cell. Like, <laughs> yeah. I just thought that was, that was something to know. Okay. I feel, um, the, I feel the difference in the papers. Uh, ultimately, I think both are important. Like whether it's big picture or small picture, they drive like your thoughts. They e equally contribute to your thought process, but it's just different. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, you need both of them, right? Like you don't want yeah. to do just one which makes sense okay so the other thing um i wanted to ask related to what you said about you know reading papers to get i guess ideas that you may or may not want to work on um open question i guess to Komal as well um did you like my experience of this right before i started my phd or before i got into research full time my perception of this is oh, may, uh, maybe a big chunk of the PhD is actually just reading papers and like thinking about problems. Um, but then once you get started, you realize like you have very little time. Like at the end of the day, um, I spend like a very small proportion of my daily work time on reading and thinking. It, it So much of my time is actually taken up by like 
procedural administrative stuff, right? Like you're doing experiments, uh, you're recording your results. Um, yeah, so that, that was just a bit of a contrast to me of, I thought there would be a lot more of reading and thinking going on, but in practice, it doesn't seem to be the case. I don't know if this is just for me, but it seems to be more broadly true, right? Like, for example, if you had asked me, how many papers do you think a PhD student reads in a week? I might have said something like 10 or 20. The reality is like one or two, at least for me, you know, uh, which I thought was was curious. How, how What were your experiences with this? For me, it depends on the phase of the research you're in. There are some periods where it's just workload heavy and you just got to produce like your results and you already know the direction you're going in. So you don't really need to read a lot of papers. But then I guess when there's points where you're not sure about what step to take next, then it becomes reading intensive, like which, um, where do you want to put your eggs in which basket? And then like how to carry out the experiment. So that becomes a lot of reading. Hmm. Yeah, I think I do struggle a lot with uh, reading papers as well. And I see some of the seniors in the lab, senior members in the lab putting up papers uh, on, the, on the group. And I think these people really just wait for it, like, like a series where a new, new episode comes out. They're really like looking out for new papers and which is very interesting. And I think it needs curiosity and it also needs like some dedication um, to be putting in this effort, putting in this time slot outside of your work hours where you're really reading um, and then sort of thinking about those problems and then linking it up with uh, what's ongoing instead of only reading when you need it. Uh, yeah, but I don't have that now. Hopefully soon we'll try. Yeah, I would say my reading habit has definitely improved with time. Like in the beginning, I think obviously, right? Uh, I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but it feels like it felt at least for me, uh, I struggled a good, like a really good amount of time to just read and get through a research paper for the first two, three, four, even years of my research, like including masters. Uh, but I think very recently, just one or two years ago, um, I finally felt like, okay, now I, I know how to like handle a research paper. I don't know where that thing came from. I think it was just you had to get go through a certain number of papers. I don't think it was mm -hmm. necessarily getting familiar with the topic because I, I have switched topics quite a bit. Yeah. Um, but I think this is like a, a strange, like, I don't know, it just took a much longer time than I thought it would to become comfortable with doing, doing it. I don't know how your experience was with this. It might be relevant a bit to topic because... Um, I'm pretty comfortable reading the papers in my field or even like adjacent to my field. But when it came to like reading your paper that you suggested, it took me like five days <laughs> because I had no idea the experiments they were doing, nor understanding yeah, no. how to interpret the experiment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that paper uh, is really an outlier. They use some technologies that I think whole of humanity doesn't understand. They just have some. <laughs> very arcane wisdom that, you know, they've received from some mysterious sources. So I think that one <laughs> I, I won't count. But it does seem like you read a diverse set of papers. Sometimes you're sharing things that are like quite far away from. I, I remember one was even like a, um, personality analysis of what was that? Startup VCs? Oh, yeah, yeah. Or something like this. I forget where... I get my updates from I used to sign up for like the email list where they send you papers but then I would always not click it and then I also use an app that would you can like type in your keywords and then it would give you papers from all different journals but then I think I only opened it when I was really bored rather than like in a daily thing yeah. then now I think um it just comes to Googling, I think, like Googling your topics yeah. and then seeing what comes up. Yeah, I mean, yeah. those are two different kinds of reading, right? Like one where you're just exploring, looking for random, interesting things versus when you need the answer to some kind of specific yeah. question. Yeah, I think those can be quite different. Hmm. Maybe it's Facebook or Twitter. <laughs> uh, oh yeah twitter, twitter is big one these days there's actually a very nice alu bot uh, that tweets recent papers it's actually super helpful 
for our, our loop? Yeah, so there's somebody built uh, uh, an R loop paper bot. So it just tweets whenever there's like a new R loop paper, it just puts out a tweet saying, oh, this paper Why is Why is this specific to one topic? I mean, that's when it's useful, right? If it was just something like cancer, I guess that would be too broad, too interesting to anybody. Oh, well, can you type in any keyword or? No, this is a bot, somebody, like this is an account oh, okay. somebody made and all it oh. does is tweet R loop papers. That's all. Oh, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Anything more to say on this topic before we move on? I I don't know. You you mentioned briefly that you want to take about talk about note taking. Is this a good point to bring that up, or or do you think that's more like experimental stuff? Mm, sure. Um, I guess one question is maybe what's your favorite apps that you use that th that help your research whether it's for like organization or analysis of data. Cause I think, or like what types of data do you actually deal with first? So for me, I have a lot of flow cytometry, Western blot, which is like an image. I have um, like cell titer glow, which is like Excel values or like also qPCR um, and then microscopy images. And then, um, like FastQ for RNA seeks. So kind of big data and pictures and Excel sheets. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess for I'll I'll answer your documentation question first because that one's easier and it's also my favorite app, which is Notion. Uh, I feel like I should be getting paid for this because I've done so much yep. free advertising for this. <laughs> <laughs> I will talk to anybody who's willing to listen about Notion. And I've joked about this, but I think uh, me talking so much about uh, Notion is also like 50% of the reason me and my ex broke up. Because <laughs> I really <laughs> shut up about it. Uh, anyway, so yeah, Notion is great because I think um, it's super versatile. Like that's the thing I, I really like about it. Uh, you can pretty much build it to be as complex or as simple as you want it to be. So you can really make it do whatever you want. Um, and I think that is my favorite feature about it because all these other apps, there's, there's quite a few, like, you know, you, you might have heard of like Benchling and other stuff that have a more opinionated design. And I think they run into this exact problem that you mentioned where different kinds of people work with different kinds of data. And when you try to optimize it too much to one, um, yeah, if, if you need to switch, it just doesn't work. So I feel like Notion can pretty much, it, it, it won't be very geared towards working with DNA data, for example, but it's just generally so good that I dump all my stuff in it um, and then it can handle it from there and then I can organize it however I want. Uh, but when I do want more like analysis or you know more complicated um, tools, not just for documentation, but for actually working with the data, then it's R. I kind of like force everything into R. Luckily, I don't have so many um, images or other things that might be a bit harder to do with R. Most of the things I work are basically tables, and R is very good at doing stuff that's in a tablet form. Um, so yeah, I think these two pretty much make up the majority of the tools I use for um, my PhD. Um, I will give a quick shout out to this very nice uh, reading app, uh, which is just called Reader. I think other there must be other tools out there that do this too. But one and really annoying thing I find at least is that papers are formatted in the most horrible way possible. They are so unfriendly to read. Uh, I don't know if you guys read PDFs, but like PDFs on a, on a screen just annoys me so much. Like why why is the text block this much in one corner. And then, you know, like there's so much space on the screen, just make use <laughs> of it. So I, I prefer like HTML readers and this one just takes the text and then parses it nicely, right? It just formats it in a neat and cute way. And that Does makes the reading experience. The images and figures? Yes, it will retain all of them because it's not extracted from the PDF, but it will extract it from the web page. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that I feel like definitely makes the my process of reading papers at least like 10, 20 percent more enjoyable, which I feel is pretty pretty worthy. Okay, sorry for the, the long time, but that's me. <laughs>
Uh, Como, how is your opinion of Notion and do you use it as well? I have heard a lot from Madan. <laughs> Somehow I've not been converted yet. I've used it a little bit. I started like, it's pretty exciting when you newly started. I made so many projects and like so many tasks and whatnot. But it's nice to like go back to it and see like, oh, these are all the things that I sort of started. I don't use it primarily for research though. Like it is, it has a lot of multiple different things. Um, for research, most of my data is, again, the sequencing stuff is uh, on servers and on in R as well as uh, Madan was mentioning. And some of the small size data sets like Western blots and again, microscopy images and what else? Excel sheets, all of this is more on Nbox and on my computer as well, which should move away from my computer. Actually, it's a little risky. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Uh, about organizing files on your computer, um, how do you think it takes you long to find the file that you're looking for? Or do you know exactly where it is? Mm, recent stuff, of course, I know better, but if I have to go back to like a few years back, so I have most I mostly have like folders with years, like 2019, 2020, 2023, 2023 like that. And then within that, I have separated them depending on the experimental um, techniques. And yeah, and just, just labeling them nicely so that you can get back to them. How about you? Um, I also did the same 2019 to 2020, but I feel like I shouldn't have done it like that because ultimately it's the same project and I'm having to jump between my years to find out which experiment went in which year. So mm -hmm. now I would have grouped it differently um, just based on like the overarching project and then perhaps I'm not sure whether to go like project and then like the topic and then the experiments mm -hmm. or yeah. do I go project then the experiments and then the little questions you have like western blot and all the different pathways you went through or mm -hmm. pathway and then you did western blot plus qpcr mm -hmm. um, but I uh Okay, going, first going back to Notion, I'm a big promoter of Notion too. Yeah. <laughs> um, I I struggle with like, like um, with organizing my files because as a PhD student, we have to make lab meetings, research meetings, meetings for collaborators, weekly meetings, and my data becomes like everywhere. It's always updated yeah. at your point. Yeah. And I can never get a full compilation of like what I did. But Notion is like, um, even with your folders, which I have to open each tab and it becomes a new window. With Notion, it, there are no windows. Um, you just have to click it and you can scroll through everything and it's all in one place if you just keep pasting your new images. So it's really great if like, say an, another, another person just asking, hey, what are you doing? I can just pull out the entire thing and know exactly where it is because it's mm. not a window. It's just like a web page. Mm. And then I can easily keep all the notes that I've done. Like usually I write on scrap papers and then I forget where the scrap paper is. Mm. But if I just put in like, I worked on this cell and I cultured it in this much media and it's always there. So Notion is like a lifesaver for me now. Um, and then... Organizing data on my computer. Okay, going back to my folder organization. I think recently, um, I think about my data, like, you know, the Ikea dresser with like, it's just a dresser and there's like the top shelf, second shelf, <laughs> third yeah. shelf, bottom shelf. And when I organize my dresser at home, the top shelf is the things that I use every day, like my lotion or um, my face salt sunscreen. And then the second shelf is like the dumping shelf where I put like the rest of the stuff that I don't usually use, like travel shampoo and like the large bottle of sunscreen. And then the, the bottom shelf is like the backups, like mm, extra shampoos <laughs> that I will only access like once it's run out. <laughs> so now my folders are also kind of like that. So it's like, what is um, raw data, for example? I don't really access it, but it's like the bottom shelf. And then um, the working data, like a graph pad, um, is the most frequently 
accessed. But sometimes I have like multiple renditions of the same file for some reason. Like I accidentally saved it because mm -hmm. it was unsaved and now it's a new title and I'll have multiple copies and I don't want to like accidentally use one and then the other. And now there's two different data on both. So then I split and I should have like a dumping ground but I don't want to delete it yet because it might have valuable <laughs> information. But I work on one and then the rest is like my dumping on the second tier of my of my dresser. Yeah, so it's kind of helpful to not get bogged down by all of the data that I have. Yeah, I think in general, being organized, this is one of those things that feels like it can take up a lot of time, it's tedious, and sometimes you just want to get the thing done. Um, but I guess the longer you, you keep doing it, you realize that it would save you a lot more time um, over time if you were just, you know, spend that extra five, ten, sometimes half an hour, one hour that it takes uh, to, ha I guess, have some system that works for you. Again, it doesn't have to be super complicated. What works for one person might not work for another person. But yeah, I guess have putting some thought into it, I feel like will will be will help it, everyone. And I guess. To add to that, there's even, I mean, I have a whole blog post on this, so I haven't spent too much time thinking about this, obviously. Uh, but if you look at it, like a lot of the really prolific scientists, uh, they are known to be like extreme maniacs when it comes to documentation. Like they document everything to the finest detail. Um, maybe there's a little bit of like correlation doesn't imply causation thing going on here, but you know, like make of it what you will, but it seems like. This is, this is one of those things that has a very positive effect. So, I mean, it also helps if you have, so for me, um, if this was all, for example, if I had to document everything in a physical lab notebook, oh God, that would be the end. Like I would not do this, but because there's like a tool like Notion that makes this process fun, I'm happy to spend some time. We really okay. need to get some sponsorship from Notion. I wish, bro. I wish <laughs> they would sponsor me. That would be dream come true. Please sponsor them. <laughs> Okay. Yes. What's next? Um, let's see. Okay, big I can ask this. Um, I think while you were sort of finishing your PhD or you had finished your PhD, you were planning on moving to industry. But in the in a recent conversation that we were having, you mentioned that now you're actually more excited towards staying in academia. You want to give it more shots, you want to more do another postdoc, explore a bit more. So do you want to just describe how these uh, your your thought process has changed and overall what do you think about industry versus academia? So I think my interest was... in industry um it really sparked especially when I went to the conference um ENA uh, ENA two thousand twenty two in Barcelona where a lot of the good research was done by companies um like producing new drugs and the efficacy of drugs or um, finding new targets that that work. And the research seems so fast because they have a goal, they have an end goal, and they are going to work towards um, like producing a product that you can actually see a value in. And when I was doing academic research, it felt like it was endless. Like we were constantly, constantly trying to seek answers that will never finish hmm. like even a, a process of questions might never end and you don't know where is the end actually because you have no like product that industry is developing right um and I was excited because they were doing good research as well and I, I like research um but then when I, I think when I was exploring in Singapore, um, there were not many research opportunities in industry. Hmm. Um, and I felt a bit limited because I have a bunch of questions and I would like to explore that um, in a productive way as well. Um, but then, in some way, there's also a limitation, I, I think, because your, your product will not vary too much. You have a, 
you have something in mind that you want to work towards. But then when I'm doing my PhD, the questions I have, um, they're not concrete enough yet because I don't, I feel like I haven't found my niche area. And if I could just uh, figure out more and answer more questions, then maybe it would be easier to apply that to industry in the future. Um, I'm not sure if I'm making sense right now. Um, but also, uh, maybe I'm just not ready to give up like the freedom of answering mm -hmm. questions. It's kind of scary. Yeah. Realistically, I think they say um, no more than two postdocs, um, no more than five to six years doing a postdoc before you jump into industry. At mm -hmm. least one postdoc is one postdoc is even better before going to industry rather than two um, because you have to learn a lot of different skills when you go to industry, such as like um, um, different types of organization or interpersonal skills. Um, hmm. Then we do academia. Uh, uh, I don't know if you were trying to say that you would end up, even if you're, even if you want the industry to be um, as your ultimate goal, you might still want to do some postdoc. Meanwhile, right? Because I, mm. I do see this as a bit like I see this where there's this often there's this conversation of um oh I'm thinking about uh you know industry or oh I want to stay in academia and people are like breaking their heads over this in like year two of their PhD. Um and, and I feel like maybe it's true, like maybe if you want to leave right after your PhD, maybe some industry jobs are better like that. Um but I do feel like in some ways you, it doesn't really change so much because um like you still want to finish your PhD, right? You, I, I assume you usually want to get your paper out as well. Um, and then, like you said, usually it probably helps also to have a postdoc and, and a few years of experience. So sometimes I just wonder if like people, you know, overthink this with, with no real uh, consequences. But, Maybe know, the, one of the factors is, um, I think we all think about um, your your salary, I guess. And they always say industry gives a better salary than better academia. Salary, true. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 On the other hand, like the other argument would be if you sort of know that you want to move to industry eventually, then in that case, right after your PhD, you would like just get in and you will start getting those skills and mm -hmm. you can escalate faster. I think you can just learn the things required there faster as opposed mm -hmm. to doing a postdoc for two years or three years. It can take long. And those papers yeah. really are not essential in that role. Yeah. So, so if you know yeah, you want to do the industry, just go for it immediately. Like don't yeah, waste your time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Basically. Basically. Yeah. You might be doing something totally different for your postdoc than what's required for the company. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You will have to learn a lot on on the job as well. So mm -hmm. might as well just go and explore that. Okay. Yes. For me, I I think learning the unexplored, which is what we are are all doing. I think that's really cool, and mm -hmm. I I don't want to give that up. So I'm staying in academia because I think there's still a lot to discover, and it would make life fun to keep exploring and discovering new things. Yeah, yeah. I I don't know how much. So my um view of this, right? And I'm, I'm not sure how useful this is to other people. So I'm somebody who has given up on the academia project. But at the same time, I'm not so tied down to it being this is the only thing worth doing. Because you do you do run into some people like that as well. They're like, become a professor or like everything else is useless. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm not in that camp. I'm open to both things. Um, and the way I see it is finish the PhD, do the whatever three, four, five years of postdoc. Um, and if things work out, if you publish well, you get some PI positions, take it. If not, go to academia. I, to me, that path feels like best of both worlds in some ways. But I can see how, like, if you're somebody who's very concerned about, I guess, career progression, and, and you know, you want to move, you want to climb the ladders, make more money, I guess that four or five years might sound like a lot in that mm. case. Yeah. Yeah. To someone like me, yeah. that's like, okay, cool, sounds good. Mm -hmm. And also the point about having flexibility, I think. I, of course, I don't have any experience in industry yet, but from the friends that moved to industry recently, 
they seemed to enjoy it like these were some of the people who were really into academia like some of the people who wanted to be pis and were at a stage where they were like senior postdocs but eventually could not find funding and things like that like obviously the field is very competitive and even at a higher stage people move to industry even big pis move to industry uh but they are also enjoying like being a pi there being a team leader there there's still quite some flexibility and there's still some good amount of research at least in the in europe and us i i believe yeah yeah i have no friends who went into industry and said they didn't like it i think everyone likes it <laughs> yeah for different reasons yeah. i guess yeah Uh, a related okay, cool. topic. There was a yeah. recent uh, academic career talk in CSI that was hosted by some some of the PIs um, from our department. Yeah. Um, and that was quite funny because so not gonna take names, okay? But um, it was led by three PIs, and at least one of them is extremely convinced that industry is like uh hell. You know, that's where mm-hmm. you like that almost like some some sort of judgment against people who choose to go to industry like as if you're yeah. giving up on yeah uh, on the path you're supposed to take and also this notion that oh in industry they don't really care about the science they're all doing it for money all these like mm-hmm. weird um all like frankly unnecessary uh baggage added on there and i guess i i wonder how much of that is a self defense mechanism knowing that you're paid less in academy <laughs> you're probably working more uh, and you get paid less uh, and i just wonder if this is just like how how you justify that to yourself yeah yeah i don't know where that conception actually comes from because like yes we've heard it before from coming from academia but ultimately the world needs both because if we just like come up with whatever we're working on industry is actually the place where it gets translated to patients yeah. so it's very necessary yeah. absolutely um i'm not sure like uh, i'm sure you can find positions within industry where there is some flexibility but i assume on in general you have you will have more flexibility sure. within academia and yeah. if you're somebody who can who cares about that then of course you choose that right w- hmm. without having to demonize people who choose uh industry was anyway completely side rant um okay what next i okay i guess i can ask you this uh okay so alison you you are probably uh an outlier in the fact that you came from the us to singapore i feel like usually the the flow is the other way around So I guess my question is how did you choose Singapore and why Singapore? Why why Singapore? Mm. It's actually a it's a non-science reason um because when I was in the US um we we celebrated like our culture but in i don't think it was it was more like superficially like what we could do there and in school it was more like um asians like a, a general umbrella we are all asian and we like in general asian food but um there was nothing really to my parents um cult, like specific culture of singaporean or malaysian culture being celebrated cuz there's so few of us there so hmm. um, i've always wanted to know like when i grow up i can't really speak chinese and i can't really teach my culture or my food to my children or um pass on like what my parents experienced um so i wanted to come back and just connect with um my grandparents here and my cousins here and learn more about my family's culture um so i did the internship here to to learn about science also as well to connect with my my grandparents yeah and, and then i continue science here because when i uh when i did my internship here um uh, it was actually like to me it was very impressive all the facilities we have and then also i would say like the amount of the good translational research that was being done here because of the close proximity of the hospital to the research facility um yeah so it was no doubt like i would like to do research here as well 
Yeah, and I guess I was just going to ask how how has your experience in in Singapore been? Like, how do you think it's different from the US? Anything? <laughs> um, I think both are great. Um, I positive. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I would say Singapore is has more regulations though. Um, yeah, because, like yeah, we're working with chemicals and like mouse work and all. We have regulations, mm -hmm. and I I don't know. Like somehow US seems a little bit more flexible flexible about this. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, not necessarily in science, I guess even in other domains of life. Mm. Same thing. <laughs> They're both nice. <laughs> uh, let's see. I think cult culturally, like when we apply to science, um it at least the graduate student society there, uh, it was very positive. I would say, like, they would have hmm. pizza and beer. Um, they would have a Halloween party, and it was all the graduate students, and they would just gather in a room and just chill and hang out and talk from the different labs. Um, it seems like here it's been more difficult just to have a casual conversation about science. Um it may be like non-science just meeting up just to get to know each other but in general it's like harder to facilitate um chill science talks or like over beer or something yeah that's a good point um i i don't know why that that is and maybe it's not fair to say like in my experience right uh even compared to india i do feel like um it's harder to get together and like talk about stuff that like it feels like usually there are sort of some tribes that you belong to usually it's like your own lab uh but not necessarily sometimes maybe it's just other people that you tend to work with and people they talk a lot but only within that and mm. I, I feel like there's not a, lo a whole lot of um intermingling that tends to happen uh i'm not sure if this is true across singapore but certainly in my master's department and also uh, in in CSI, that that has been my observation, which is quite strange. I I don't understand why why people struggle to like talk to people outside. Think, that like, group. Is it because of our topic? Like within cancer, there's so many different things that we're studying that it's hard to bring up what we're studying. Could be maybe that's the downside of having just the cancer science institute. To be, you know, it's not like aligned enough. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I do feel like on some level it's just like an attitude issue. Like if mm -hmm. by attitude, yeah, I mean it's like, yeah, just the way you look at it, right? Because mm -hmm. I do feel but um, outside yeah. of research, like if you meet people outside of labs and CSI, for example, for for Allison, for example, do you do you feel a difference between the US and here? I'm sorry, I don't really have many friends. <laughs> <laughs> Really <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, yeah, to be fair, even most of my friends are from CSI. <laughs> yeah, I would say this. It's I think from others, it's I mean, more, I think it's easier to incubate ideas overseas, though, than it is here. There seems to be less barrier. Hmm. Yeah, to me, I mean, I haven't really been uh, in any country apart from India and, and Singapore, so I can't comment about compared to US. But I feel within Singapore, there is a bit of, um, at least in this graduate school environment, um, it would it's easier to bond with international students than, you know, mm -hmm. with like locals. And I mean, this makes sense. It's probably true no, in cool. other cases as well. But probably if you're a local, you have friends here, you already have like a group and you see that as enough, maybe. So it tends to be harder. Of course, not everybody is like that. There are some Singaporeans who are very good friends and, you know, we hang out with them. But in, in tendency, that is what I have noticed. It's the international community, like people who are, who are expats here, they tend to be a bit more social uh, than the hmm. others. I agree with you. Okay. Um, okay, so then picking up on <laughs> your comment about not having friends. I thought it was interesting. 
because <laughs> um, I actually wouldn't think that of you. I think I would label you as uh, one of those people who actually like goes out of their way to, I guess, talk to people and like, maybe not, you know, like always, but I feel like you certainly um, make some effort. Uh, like you can, you can tell me what you think about that. But in general, um, my broader question is, I feel like in science, most people identify as introverts, but among that, there's two. One who just take that at face value and just never talk to people. But there's the other bunch who feel that way, but still make the effort to like talk to others because they see some value in it. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, yes, I think you are right in that I, I would like to reach out to people. Um, I think even in like, like near my near my home like I just see someone walking and they're carrying like an abcam bag the ones that we get for free from abcam and I'm like oh you're a scientist and I would just say hi where are you from and then they have a DNC CSI as well I'm like that's really cool um and then later on I see them here again and then I'm just like hi um but it also depends I guess like becoming close to people to consider them my friend it's just inherently do we click and I don't know why like um perhaps it's it's easier to click with some than others yeah that's what I think we have to mm -hmm. but I usually feel like in a lot of cases even that even if you don't consider them a friend this sort of distant but pleasant relationship you could have um a lot of people don't really even try it because they have this label of mm -hmm. introvert. Uh, yeah, like, I mean, everybody feels introverted, right? I feel like the label doesn't really do much because in, in practice, it's it's more of like a, a spectrum. And a spectrum. Yeah, and even I feel like different times of your own life, you're, you're on like different parts of it. So having mm -hmm. labels like that usually don't help. Like I, I've seen this in with me. Like when I was younger, I was certainly more introverted. If you want to use those use that language, where I had like a close group of friends. I would talk to them a lot, but I wouldn't. I wasn't really like talking outside of that um, very much until I moved here and I was sort of forced to do that. And then I realized, oh, I actually enjoy this. Um, and still, like there are moments where some days I don't want to. Uh, but I feel like not having that label of like calling myself an introvert helps me. Like it just makes it easier on some days when I'm on the fence. Um, you know, without the label, it's just easier to like talk to people. So I feel like, yeah, I, the reason I bring this up is, you know, I don't know if you guys have done that 16 personalities test, whatever, whatever. Uh, it's basically just like a, you have a bunch of questions and then you respond to them. So it's, it's self-report and then it tells you um, what personality types you are. And mm. There's like 30 people in my lab and unanimously everybody uh, was an introvert. And that's funny <laughs> because the questions reflect how you see yourself, right? Mm. Uh, and fair, maybe in science, it really does attract more introverts. But I do feel like there's a little bit of self-fulfilling thing going on here. Mm. Um, that's an interesting point. Yeah, the concept is usually like the extrovert adopts an introvert. And I think that really helped me along life because um, even when I was like a primary school kid, um, the teacher writing the report says, Allison never talks in class, but once she's on the playground, she's like really talkative. And that's how I am now still like in the indoors, I'm just really quiet. But if I'm on the badminton court, then I can like shout and have fun. Um. But yeah, otherwise, usually if I'm not talking, I'm always quiet until an extrovert adopts me and <laughs> brings me to the light to talk. <laughs> and uh, in different phases of life, I've always had that one extrovert and is I'm very grateful for them. Otherwise, I would really just mm -hmm. not talk and forget how to talk even. Okay, yeah, it happens. <laughs> no, actually, I really relate with Alison here. Like even normally left to left if somebody leaves me by myself, I would not talk either. It's only when like somebody comes up and start, strikes a conversation and then it can go anywhere. But I feel like with time, I'm also becoming more open, which is very nice. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I think with people who I click, as Alison mentioned, I can talk a lot. 
um, but with newer people, I'm still a little, little reserved. And then it takes some time to sort of um, make that bond. And again, depends on if we click or not. Yeah, but I think, yeah. I don't know, how, how. what's the longest that we can stay silent? Should test that sometime. <laughs> I don't think we need to. I think it has to be, how long can we keep talking? <laughs> True. Not very long. I have a I have a friend again. I won't take the name. Um, he the, when I first like met him and I started talking to him, it was kind of hard to understand it because he would speak softly and he would speak very fast. Uh, so I think one day I just jokingly asked him, you know, why is it so hard to understand you? And he unironically looked me dead in the eye and he said, I didn't talk for like six months, so I forgot how to speak. Like <laughs> no expectation <laughs> offered. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? Okay. Did you ask? So, Did you get an explanation anytime later? Or no? You, this no, is all the information you have. Reason. Yeah, that was legit the reason. He was just uh, at home. I guess not a lot yeah. of friends. And doesn't talk to his family wow. also that much. So he was just spending a like insane amount of time every day without talking to anybody. And then at some point, he just really forgot how to speak. That's like, it improved okay. Uh, it has improved my life. <laughs> okay, so it's curable. Uh, I think we covered most of the questions. We can talk about hobbies, if you would like. So I guess I, I will ask you a phrase like differently. How do you how do you unwind from from work? What are the things that bring you some relaxation, joy? How do you want to think about it? Your favorite activities? Nowadays, I don't I don't do much. Um, I think eating home cooked food is definitely special for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I really do get that now since like I, I don't cook myself um, and exercise is also very important to me I think in a way like when you tie it into like talking it's a practice and somehow exercise to me raises the bar of like my ability to do things because I have pushed myself and when I stop exercising like the laziness creeps in and I'm like I I feel like doing anything is harder than it usually seems. So I'm actually trying to um, exercise more, but usually like class packages are quite expensive. So I'm figuring out like the most economical way to get my um, my gymming in or whatever. Yeah, let me know if you figure it out. This is something I constantly struggle with. I, I yeah. totally agree. Yeah, like, whenever I, I like do manage either. to get some exercise in. I just feel like I have so much energy that week. But at the same time, it's so much, it's it's just so difficult to like go do something. Yeah. You know, a lot of things take money, like you like you say, but yeah, do let me know if you figure it out. What's your favorite activity? Um badminton. But that takes a it takes about like three to four hours for one hmm. session. Like commute. I think uh, for me, badminton is quite easy because you're like forced to run because you have to catch the ball, like the, the shot clock. Um, rather than like gymming or running, it's like you have to force yourself to motivate yourself. Yeah, yeah. And I hate going to the gym. Like one of my housemates is so into and she would go to the gym all the time. She'll call me and I'm like, no, I'm not coming. Even if she's there, I just don't enjoy exercising in a gym. I would rather just do any game, just play some sport. Mm. So yeah. what do you guys like to do then? Um, for sports, um, I, I really like football, like to play with friends. It's like you said, once the ball is there, it, the whole context is just completely reversed, right? Like I have the problem of not wanting to stop when I'm playing football, uh, mm. which is so not true with exercise, right? Every pull-up is just taking every <laughs> bit of energy I have to make me uh, push it. So I, I totally agree. But the problem with that is, like you said, sports usually takes longer and it's hard to coordinate Like because usually you need multiple people and it's yeah. not so easy to do like regular like, you. like football for example, we don't even play as that many. Sometimes it's just four of us but even that takes like ridiculously it's just so difficult to get a slot where everybody's free. Yeah. Yeah. Actually this yeah, week I was thinking about football. I, I wanted to try it because like try I think doing something that you don't usually do is also quite exciting because it's mm -hmm. like different parts of your brain and like yeah is always good because um 
you shouldn't get too comfortable in life I think it helps you explore more so I wanted to do football yeah, but then the hurdle is like who do you want to play with and like how <laughs> cool we, we have a like a nice five side uh like a foot side ground near the near the house we can play there okay yeah mm -hmm. what else can we do sports Mm. One thing I I also liked was yoga, but yoga is definitely expensive. You want to do it in a class. Mm. And my house has no space for a yoga mat, so I can't do it at home either. I remember I used to be pretty good at yoga when I was at home. Oh. Not anymore. You like doing it? Uh, I enjoyed doing it before because I think I was somehow naturally flexible, so I was pretty good at it. Uh, but when I try now, I can't do any of the things I used to be able to do. But I'm sure if I like practice it, it practice it can come back. Yeah. Kumal, do you do anything? I know uh, you're very want... artsy, but <laughs> you're very artsy. Mm, do you yes, feel like that... you exercise though? Uh, at one point, mm, I was playing PT with my housemates, and some at some point also with my lab mates. But that sort of fizzled out. Uh, then we were running. At one point when we were doing the marathon thing, that was quite fun. Yeah. Again, a group activity. Um, sometimes we also still run, but also with my lab mates. So that's quite nice. We'll try to resume when I'm back. Um, yeah, we have been discussing this earlier as well. We need to figure out something which is a bit more regular and easy, not not so um, time consuming either. Yeah, let's let's yeah. see. I guess oh, I also plan on. Okay. So we have soccer and table tennis and badminton. That's right. <laughs> we have it. Let's see how. <laughs> Getting the exercise in. It has to be regular. <laughs> it has to be regular, yeah. Yeah. Okay. What else? Do we have anything else? Recently, I realized that I don't like writing. And, hmm. you know, like, when was the last time you wrote an essay with, like, an introduction and then your three supporting claims and then a conclusion like you know for school like when was the last time you did that um you're saying like non-scientific writing yeah oh i mean mother mother does it <laughs> often yeah <laughs> you do that often he's a writer let's not say i'm a writer but i like to write you are a writer come on yeah this uh I don't write enough, like I don't write frequently enough to qualify as a writer, but I do like writing. It's, like it's difficult. I'm not going to say it's easy, um, but on the days that I do manage to do it, it's quite a work. Do you think writing helps you um, with, any, like, with yourself? Uh, 100%. Like, I guess if you're talking about ideas, right, um, some of like, the things that I have already written about in the past are the things that I'm most articulate about. Like when I talk about them, I can clearly like mm. describe them. It just comes across much nicer as opposed to things I've never tried to write down. Even if I feel I'm very familiar, like writing just like puts this certain level of, um, what's the word? like Concreteness. It, yeah, concreteness. Like you, you might think this idea you have in your head is great. And then you put it on paper and you read it and you see it's shit. You know, it's just yeah. like, it makes it very concrete. And I guess that's why mm. it can be, kind of uncomfortable to write in the first place because you have to like mm. refine them until they sound nice to you uh but i like at the end of it i feel like that is like a a worthy thing to have done you know, to have gone through your ideas and yeah and That's the thing cool. is i feel like i don't know if this is true so much but i feel like if you only do if you're only writing about very complicated ideas which tends to be the case with like scientific writing um I feel like you don't fully get the hang of it or it, or it takes like a very long time because the ideas are complex, the process is also complex. Um, and I feel like there's just too much going on for that for you to like learn very quickly. So almost by accident, because I write about dumb stuff on the blog. These are not very complicated topics, but you still just by going through that process of with like simpler ideas in some ways, you become more comfortable with the writing process. Mm -hmm. And then I think then it can transfer not fully, but it just makes dealing with complex ideas a bit less tedious. When did you start actually, like this this writing? Um, when did I hobby? start? Like, oh, 
like I tried to write a book when I was in second grade or third grade. Okay. Uh, my mom, my mom still kept it very embarrassing. Uh, but it's cute. It's <laughs> so a sweet. cute effort. Yeah, of trying. Uh, but I think properly, regularly writing only started. So I always enjoyed writing assignments in school. You know the essays that we had to do. Uh, even during exams, like I think I was one. Like I really enjoyed that process, and I think having a good teacher also helped. Like she would, like I had one very teacher who was formative in me feeling like, oh, I like writing. But she would give good feedback on whatever things I would write. So I think that helped a lot. Although I was never really doing that outside of school projects or like you know random additional. Uh, assignments I would take on. Um, purely for myself, I only started like undergrad, undergrad masters. Uh, for a while, I was like just writing and never publishing. And I think only during COVID, I I started making it public. Mm. Made a blog and you know, started sharing. Um, for me, when I'm writing the paper now, I always feel like I'm running out of words to use or not understanding like. Um, the, a way to phrase a sentence that is scientifically appropriate. Hmm. Um, but I guess just writing seems more difficult than usual because I don't usually write now. Um, I actually just came across a, a website called Daily Prompt. They just give you prompts and then you just like creatively write um, like a story or something. I'm not sure if that's helpful because you just have to come up with like your story and then write about it. And I'm not sure if you get feedback either on like how good your writing is. Did you used to write ever like as a in school or something? Uh, essays, yes. Um, like SATs and class assignments. And I don't even remember how I did those anymore. It was so long ago. And I feel like the vocabulary then was a lot better than it is now. Yeah, I mean, we are not reading so much fiction anymore, I guess. Reading so many dull scientific papers, it definitely shapes your head in a way. Are you... Uh, I feel like scientific papers really don't use a lot of creative words. Like, I, I tried hitting <laughs> on ChatGBT, can you please write my introduction? And they wrote it full on, like, a storyline. And I'm like, please do not write it in this way. <laughs> Can you Please make don't it? make it sound so fun, okay? It has to be boring and dull and it makes you want yes. to make me And then they made That's it the appropriate scientific manner. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Uh, like the, This is an interaction I have very often with Dennis, right? He would, uh, let's say I have to write something, uh, like an abstract for a conference or something, uh, and then I will show him, right? So I know that he, he will do the editing very heavily. So I take the liberty of using some flair, hoping that he would leave a little bit in. So I go a bit overboard, <laughs> hoping that he would, you know, uh, at least like feel pretty for me and leave one or two nice words. But no, it always comes back. Oh man. Fully chopped out and like shit. We'll try again next time. I think mine becomes the opposite. I lay out the bare skeleton as my abstract, and Anand's like, this is boring. You need to make oh. it engaging. And then he's the one who does a creative flair. Oh. Yeah, a bit of balance, I guess. <laughs> I, I do agree. Yeah, actually, reading scientific papers, I don't realize if I can tell the author's personality or not. I think no. They're all, like, the same. Yeah. There's some the longest, better than the I mean, others. <laughs> yeah, for the longest time, I've been trying to, like, make a list of papers that read really well. Um, I think I have two. Or maybe three that's it. Okay. So it's very rare that you come across something that really feels. Is one of them which had the word peppered in it? Oh yeah, that that one kind of makes sense. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So so for context, they were trying to say that this mutational profile is spread across the genome, uh, but instead of spread, they said peppered. It's like oh, that's cute. <laughs> yeah, I wish more people would do that. These are kind of okay. Uh, how we should end? I feel like people complain that episodes just end abruptly without an ending. Oh, oh, oh. So should we try to do an ending? Okay. Well, first, I would like to thank you guys for inviting me. Not like that. <laughs> <I think. laughs> Earlier in this episode, I said you should always do something that you're scared of because mm. 
it opens your doors. And so I'm scared of talking, I guess. And this was very enjoyable. I hope to see you guys on this podcast again. Wow. We would love to have you as well. Yeah. Yeah. And we had like, I had a great time knowing so much more about you. (laughs) Thank you. Yes. We shall definitely do this again. Yeah, again, same goes for me. I have said this like a few times. I don't know why I'm doing this podcast. I also (laughs) struggle with speaking. (laughs) But it's happening and it's going well. So let's do it. The order, that is the order. What's the letter letter order? Oh, Madan, then me, then Alison on the bottom. Okay. How do I do O? How is O? How does B work? We tried. (laughs) <laughs> okay. Okay. Got it. <laughs> Thanks, guys.